Good evening, everyone. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for this evening that you have granted us. We pray that as we are seated in your presence, you would be our teacher and you would be our guide. You would be the interpreter for us this evening, O Lord. I pray that you would open the scriptures for all of us and you would make it a blessing for us. We would be drawn closer to you and we would be better disciples of you, O Almighty God. Lord, I submit all of us into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are continuing with our discussion on the series, The End of the Age. Last Wednesday, we had some discussions from the book of Daniel. We were looking at chapters 2 and 7. And I want us to quickly be reminded of the things that we have discussed before we move ahead into discussions on chapter 9 for today. All right, so let me bring this chapter 2, a diagram that I have, to our attention. We discussed that King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, a dream in which he saw a huge and dazzling statue, a statue that had its head made of gold, its chest and arms were made of silver, and then its belly and thighs were made of bronze, the legs were made of iron, the feet were made of iron and clay mixed together, and so on. And we found out that the explanations of it are fairly simple. God was providing Nebuchadnezzar a panoramic view of world history as it was to happen from that time onwards till the second coming of Jesus Christ. We discussed the fact that the head of gold represented the Babylonian empire. It represented King Nebuchadnezzar. And the Babylonian empire was then to be followed by a kingdom that was symbolized by silver, the Medo-Persian empire. And following which, there was to be another empire which was shown by uh, bronze, the belly and thighs of bronze, the Greek empire was symbolized by bronze. And then we had the Roman Empire following that, which was symbolized by iron. Because of its ferociousness and strength, it was symbolized by iron. And then the feet made of iron and clay. And in that dream, King Nebuchadnezzar saw a rock that came uncut by human hands and strike the base of the statue. And the whole statue was destroyed. In fact, all these empires crumbled down into powder. They became like chaff on a spring evening, such that they were blown by the wind. And this rock that hit the statue became a huge mountain that covered the whole earth. And Daniel, Daniel in his explanation, explains that God is going to establish his kingdom towards the end, and it would be a kingdom that would be forever, it would never be replaced, and it would cover all the earth. And so Daniel chapter 2 is something that we discussed last week. And then we looked at Daniel chapter 7 as well. We looked at the four beasts that were discussed there. The first, and I told us that Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 are parallel chapters. They're discussing the same things from two different angles. The first beast that Daniel sees is a lion with wings, representing the Babylonian empire and probably Nebuchadnezzar himself, because it says that his wings were plucked and he was lifted up from the earth and made to stand like a man and so on. So the first beast, the ferocious lion with wings of eagles, representing the Babylonian empire. And just like in chapter 2, the Babylonian empire was to be followed by another empire, the Medo-Persian empire, we have a second beast in chapter 7, which is a bear. And the bear is raised up on one of its sides. The explanation being that the Persian part of the empire was much stronger than the Medo part of the empire. It had three ribs in its mouth, probably pointing to the ferocity with which it attacked nations and devoured them. And then you have another animal, the third beast, which represents the Greek kingdom. This is a leopard with four wings. And if you remember, we discussed the fact that leopard is one of the fastest of animals. And when you add to that the four wings that go with it, we are talking about the speed with which the Greek empire established itself under Alexander the Great. 
And that picture tells us that leopard had four heads, probably a pointer towards the four commanders of uh, Alexander's army, among whom the empire was divided after the death of Alexander the Great. And finally, the fourth beast that is not likened to any animal, but it is said to be exceedingly dreadful and a terrible beast with iron teeth and so on, representing the Roman Empire. In Daniel chapter 7, we discussed that there is a scene which has no parallel in Daniel chapter 2, the vision of the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is in the background as far as Daniel 2 is concerned, but is very much in the forefront as far as Daniel 7 is concerned. And we read of the Son of Man who is brought into the presence of the Ancient of Days, and he is being given honor and glory and power and all of that. And we compared that with the stone that struck the statue at its feet of Daniel chapter 2. And just like the stone establishes itself into a mountain that covers the whole earth. The Son of Man is given all dominion and power and authority. And finally, you have all these kingdoms and peoples of every language, every tribe, and so on, bowing down before him and worshiping him. So Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 2 being parallels of each other. Each of these chapters providing us with a panoramic view of world history from the time of the Babylonian Empire until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I want us to see that there are other chapters, long chapters, that speak of biblical prophecy as well in the book of Daniel. We discussed chapter 2 and chapter 7. Chapter 8 is the vision of a ram and a goat. It actually is talking of a conflict between the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek emperor or empire. Now, you must remember the order in which these kingdoms come, the Babylonian Empire, Medo-Persian Empire, Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. I'll repeat that. It's Babylonian first, Medo-Persian after that, Greek, and then the Roman Empire. So, when the time for the end of the Medo-Persian Empire came and the Greek Empire was rising up, Alexander the Great, that conflict between the last kings of Medo-Persia and the first emperor of the Greek Empire, Alexander the Great, is described for us in Daniel chapter 8 in the vision of a ram and a goat. A fascinating chapter because there is the description of a vision and then the interpretation provided as well. Again, Alexander the Great, the four commanders and the division and all of that is mentioned in that chapter. Daniel chapter 9 is the chapter that we're going to pick up today, a chapter that discusses 70 weeks, a complicated subject, but we will try and handle that today. Chapter 11 is speaking about the conflict between two houses, two families within the Greek empire. Remember, the Alexander the Great's kingdom was divided into four parts, and out of these, two of the parts became strong. The Ptolemies to the south and the Seleucids to the, uh, to the northern side. And so chapter 11 describes the conflicts between these two houses, the kings of the north and the kings of the south, a long chapter with probably 100 or more prophecies which were all fulfilled in due time. Now, this chapter has so many prophecies to it that critical scholars are arguing that probably Daniel did not see these as visions. They were all written after the incident happened because they cannot believe that such accurate prophecies can be made by God through any of his servants. But we have no problem in assuming that Daniel wrote these works because we believe in a God that is capable of predicting the future accurately. Now, let's get into Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. Remember, Daniel was taken into exile in BC 605. And he was a teenager then. Almost 70 years have passed by. 
and he is most probably in his 80s now. But he is a man of prayer, he is a man of the word. And when he was searching the scriptures, especially the book written by Jeremiah, he came to understand that after 70 years, the Babylonian empire is supposed to expire. And after 70 years, the people of God are supposed to come back to the land that they previously possessed. And therefore, he comes into the presence of the Lord with this understanding from the book of Jeremiah that the people of God are supposed to come back to the land of Israel, and he starts praying to the Lord. The exiles for, were for a long time desiring to return back to the land of Israel. Now, before we continue with chapter 9 of Daniel, I want to take you to those passages in Jeremiah where Jeremiah prophecies this 70 years, okay? Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 1 through 2, 3. The word came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Jeremiah the prophet said to all the people of Judah and to all those living in Jerusalem, he says, for 23 years, the word of the Lord has come to me and I have spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. This is the first year of Nebuchadnezzar being king over Babylon. They have not attacked the southern kingdom. But Jeremiah says that in this particular year, I stood up among the people and I talked to them. And I told them, for 23 years, I have been a prophet among you. And I have been speaking to you God's word. But you have not been listening to what I have to say. And therefore, Jeremiah goes and goes ahead and prophesies this. He says, therefore, the Lord Almighty says this. Because you have not listened to my words, this whole country will become a desolate wasteland. And these nations, including the nations surrounding the southern kingdom, will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation the land of the Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord, and I will make it desolate forever. I will bring on that land all the things that I have spoken against it, all that are written in this book and prophesied by Jeremiah against all the nations. What is Jeremiah saying to the people of Judah, the southern kingdom? He is saying, guys, I have been talking to you for 23 years now. You have not been listening to God's word. I have been always telling you, repent and turn to the Lord. Otherwise, punishment is coming. But you have stopped your ears and you have not listened to what I had to say. And therefore, this nation, along with many surrounding nations, are going to be captured by the king of Babylon. And the Babylonian empire would come to an end at the end of 70 years, he says. And I will bring destruction upon the king of Babylon as well. So the 70 years, Daniel probably picked up from here. There is one more place where Dan uh, Jeremiah says the same thing. Jeremiah 29, 1 through 14. Now remember, in three waves, the people of God were being taken into exile in Babylon. Jeremiah was shown kindness by King Nebuchadnezzar. He was free to be wherever he wanted to be. He chose to be in the promised land. And he knows that the people that have been taken away are confused in their minds. A lot of questions as to what we are to do and all of that. And therefore, Jeremiah writes a letter to these exiles in Babylon. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried in exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. In other words, God is saying, it's not Nebuchadnezzar who carried you away, it is I who took you from exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. When the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and to give you a future. Now, God is telling the Israelites that I have plans for you. And I know the plans I have for you. I want you to know that I have plans for you. And I want you to know that the plans that I have for you are good plans. They are not plans to destroy you and to destruct you. They are plans to bring you to prosperity and to good future and a good hope and all of that. So 
Jeremiah now prophesying to the exiles in Babylon, telling them that after the 70 years are over, Babylon will fall down and you people will be brought back to the land of Israel. All right, remember Daniel chapter 9, how it started. In the first year of King Darius, the Mede, right? The Babylonian Empire had just fallen. The Medo-Persian Empire had just come into existence. It was the first year of King Darius. Daniel remembers this and he is telling God, God, it seems like it's time for the people of God to return to the land of Israel and so his prayer. But before we come to Daniel chapter 9, I have some more verses that I want to bring to your attention, this time from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 44, 24 to 28 first. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer who formed you in the womb, he is speaking to the Israelites. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of false prophets and makes, makes fools of diviners, but who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, it shall be inhabited. Of the towns of Judah, they shall be rebuilt. And of their ruins, I will restore them. Who says to the watery deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams. Who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. Almost 150 years before King Cyrus, who was a Persian king, was born, Isaiah is speaking on behalf of God, and he is saying that there will come a king who will one day declare of Jerusalem, let it be inhabited. About the towns of Judah, let they be rebuilt, and about their ruins, I will restore them. And God names that king by name, calls him out by name, says he is Cyrus, and he says he is my shepherd who will accomplish all that I plan for him. And he will be the one who would restore the city of Jerusalem and the people of Jerusalem back to its land and so on. By the way, when Isaiah is speaking this, I want us to know that the people of God have not gone into exile. Jerusalem has not been destroyed. The towns of Judah are just as they are. They have not been destroyed. And yet God speaks through Isaiah about King Cyrus who will ultimately be responsible for the return, at least the first return of the people of God back into the land of Israel. So Cyrus, God calls him my servant, my shepherd. Isaiah 45, that's a continuation of the previous passage. Listen to these fascinating statements. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him, and to strip kings of their armor, now listen to this carefully please, to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you, O Cyrus, and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places. Who is God talking to? God is talking to a pagan king who is not yet born. What is his name? His name is Cyrus. He would come 150 years later as the king of Persia, all right? And God is telling him that I'm going to do some miraculous things in your life. And all this so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. I have talked about you before you were born, O Cyrus, and I want, I'm doing this so that you would know that I am God. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you my by name. In other words, I have plan two. Plan A is that you would know that I'm God. Number two, I want you to be useful in the restoration of the people of God into the land of Israel. So I summon you by name and bestow on you a title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. You do not know me, and yet I'm going to do this for you. I am the Lord and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Now, people of God, I think we need to pause here and listen to something very, very fascinating. The city of Babylon was well built with several walls, several feet high, walls within walls, the palace being at the very center of the city of Babylon. 
They had huge gates made of bronze and iron and with all these fascinating structures which could not be easily destroyed. The city of Babylon was very, very well built. The river Euphrates passed through the middle of the city. You know, so the city of Babylon was on both sides of the river, but it was covered by this wall where the river passed. There were gates at both sides. And when the Medo-Persian troops tried to get into the city, what they did is they channelized the water of the Euphrates away into another direction. As a result of which the water, the level of water flowing through Babylon decreased to a considerable degree. As a result of which these soldiers of Medo-Persia could enter in to the city of Babylon. The Babylonians were not expecting that. They were not very careful about it. As a result of which the inner gates and the inner doors were not locked and bolted. Many of them were open and the Medo-Persians could access these places very, very easily. Herodotus, a Greek historian, narrates that it is strange that the Medo-Persians found the many inner gates within the city open and they were easily able to get into the city of Babylon. Look at the statements that God says to Cyrus in the beginning of this passage. He says, I will open doors before you so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you and level the mountains. These huge walls around the city of Babylon that look like mountains would be like nothing when I will open a door for you because you would be easily be able to enter into the land. I will bake, break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron and God speaking to Cyrus, all those things that he is going to do for him. And he says all this so that you would know that I am the Lord and I summon you by Name For the sake of my servant Jacob, because chapter 44 spoke that he is the one who is to make the decrees for the people of Israel to return back to the land of Israel. Ezra chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, that is, the people of land would come back, people of God would come back to the land after 70, 70 years. In order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, the one about whom Isaiah was prophesying. God moved his heart to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Look at the words that Cyrus is speaking, almost like he is a believer in the God of Israel, right? He says, the God of Israel has, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord. In other words, any of you guys, you Jewish folks, if you are interested in going back to Jerusalem and building the temple for yourself and staying in the land, here, you, here it is, you have my permission to go back. The God of Israel, he says, who is in Jerusalem. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Now, how in the world did Cyrus know about this? The Jewish historian Josephus records an account for us of the day when Cyrus read Isaiah's prophecy about him. In fact, some commentators tell us that Daniel is the one who took a copy of the scroll of the book of Isaiah and handed it over to Cyrus for him to read the prophecies concerning him in Isaiah chapter 44 and chapter 45. And Josephus tells us that he was moved to see what was told about him. And that is what we read here. The Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make this declaration. And so God speaking through Isaiah to King Cyrus and now through Daniel to King Cyrus. You see how God is doing his own thing in the world. Last Wednesday, we discussed about God speaking to King Nebuchadnezzar at least five times in his life. Very, very real, solid encounters with the God of Israel so that he would know who God is. 
And now here is God speaking to Cyrus, king of Persia, first through the scroll of the book of Isaiah and then through Daniel himself. But I think we are getting ahead of the picture. We are talking about the people of the Lord coming back into the land, but I think we need to get back to Daniel chapter 9, where we read these verses before in the first year of Darius, king of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. In other words, Daniel, the 85 plus year old man, is now in fasting and prayer because he recognizes that it is time for the people of God to go back to the land of Israel. And he is asking God, when are we to start counting these 70 years from? Is it BC 605 when the first wave of people came to Babylon? Or is it BC 597 when the second wave of people came from Jerusalem to Babylon? Or is it BC 586 when the temple was destroyed? And he he is hoping, I believe, that God would count these 70 years from BC 605 because the people of God would have a chance earlier to go back to the land of Israel. Especially the fall of the Babylonian Empire was probably an indication that he understood that it is time for the people of God to go back and therefore this prayer. Let, let me read quickly through the prayer as well which is found in Daniel chapter 9. Lord, you are righteous but this day we are covered with shame. This is a prayer, a fascinating prayer of repentance, of confession, and strong appeals to the Lord. And he says, Lord, the fact that we are here is not your fault. You are righteous in bringing us here. We rightly deserve this judgment, this punishment, but we are covered with shame, he says. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings and our princes and our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us. So he is a man of God who has read his Bible well. He knows what is written by Moses and he recognizes that what Moses has foretold as punishments would come. On a previous day, we did discuss Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 and God telling the Israelites that if you obey me and keep my covenant and follow me in my ways, blessing after blessing after blessing would follow you. And if you were not to obey me and if you would break my covenant, you would not walk in my paths, there would be punishments coming your way. And therefore, Punishments were also told as to what kind of punishments they would be. And so Daniel speaking here, saying that, Lord, those punishments have come upon us. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. In other words, Lord, we are really, really sorry. Lord, we ask you for pardon. He continues, he says, now, Lord, our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong, O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away from your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Remember, he is praying for the people of God. He's praying for the city of God and he's praying for the sanctuary of God. The people of God, the city of God, and the sanctuary of God. And he says, Lord, please take your anger away from us. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem, the city, and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. 
For your sake, my God, do not delay, because your city and your people bear your name. In other words, at least for the sake of your name, O Lord, have mercy on us and cause us to return back to the place that we have come from. Now, Daniel, when he was praying this prayer, we read in chapter 9, verse 20 to 23. While I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and making my request to the Lord, my God, for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, he had not finished his prayer yet, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. That's about 3 p.m. All right, by the way, for more than 60 years, Daniel has not witnessed an evening sacrifice. He's remembering something from childhood when he was a young boy in Jerusalem. And he says, at that time, approximately around 3 p.m., I had Gabriel come in a swift flight to me. He instructed to me and said, Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And now we get into the 70 weeks itself. Now, Angel Gabriel speaks to Daniel and he says, Daniel, give me a minute, please. Daniel, you have been praying for the restoration of the people of God, the rebuilding of the city of God and the temple of God after the 70 years. That's good. God is going to do his thing in his time. He is not going to go back on his word, but he has plans to reveal to you something greater that is going to happen to your people, to your city, and to your sanctuary. All right, those are the things that you were praying for. And God proceeds to give Daniel a panoramic view of history now for the Jewish people from that time till the second coming of Christ. Just like Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7 were chapters where God gave panoramic views of world history from the Gentile angle, now God is doing the same thing from the Jewish angle. And so he says, you were speaking about the 70 years, Daniel, weren't you? But I have a plan that is called the 77s. The NKJV has it as 70 weeks are decreed or determined for your people and your holy city. And what would happen after the end of the 70 weeks? It would, transgression would be finished. There would be an end to sin. Wickedness would be atoned for. Everlasting righteousness would be ushered in. Vision and prophecy would be sealed. And the most holy place, or the NKJV has it as the most holy, would be anointed. So six things to happen towards the end of the 70 weeks. Three negative, three positive. Sin, transgression, wickedness, all to be removed and to be replaced by righteousness, the sealing up of the vision and prophecy because people would no longer need vision and prophecy because they would be in close proximity to God and also the most holy one would be anointed. I wonder whether it is a reference to what we are talking about in Daniel chapter 7 when the Son of Man comes into the presence of the Ancient of Days, that probably being the anointing of the most holy. He says this, Know and understand this from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. People of God, we will have to pause here multiple points and listen to the commentary. So please don't go continue reading that, all right? So let's go step by step. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. In other words, Daniel, don't be afraid. That decree is going to come that people can go back to the land of Israel and restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That's going to come. Don't you worry about that. But from that time, I want you to start counting. All right? I'll come to explain the 70 weeks in a minute. Until the anointed one, the ruler, the, Greek, the Hebrew word used there for the anointed one is the word Messiah. So from the time the decree would go forth for the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem until the time of the coming of the Messiah, the ruler, there would be seven sevens and 62 sevens. What does that mean? Well, some translations have it as 70 weeks, right? A week is supposed to mean seven days. So does 70 sevens mean 70 multiplied by seven days? Probably not. The seven 
The sevens that are talked of here, or the week that is spoken of here, is actually a week of seven years, right? In the Old Testament, the people of God were told that you were to work for six days and rest on the Sabbath day, the seventh day, right? Similarly, the land was to be tilled for six years, and the Sabbath year, you're supposed to give rest to the land. Therefore, there were seven days in a week, there were seven years in a in a week as well. And therefore, biblical scholars are of the opinion that we should consider this week as seven years. And therefore, when he is talking about 70 weeks, we are talking about 70 multiplied by seven years. So two events to happen, the decree of the building of Jerusalem going forth and the coming of the Messiah. Between these two events, there would be seven sevens and 62 sevens, seven plus 62, 69, so 69 sevens in between. So if we are to consider them as years, this is 69 multiplied by seven, which is 483 years, right? So, uh, Daniel, I'm giving you two milestones, two events that are to, be, to happen in the future. And between these would be 483 years, he says. Let's continue reading with the passage. He says, after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death. That's not good news, at least from Daniel's perspective at that point. Why should the Messiah, the anointed one, be put to death? I assume he wondered, but he is told that after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will put to death. The NIV has it and will have nothing but NKJV, but not for himself. That means the Messiah will be killed, but not for himself. In other words, he will be killed for other people. When you couple this passage with Isaiah 53, you understand why the Messiah had to be killed. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Remember, Daniel is being told about his people, about his city, and about his sanctuary. All right, he says that when the Messiah would be cut off, there would be a people ruling the land, and the ruler of this people would come destroy the city of Jerusalem again, and the sanctuary again as well. In other words, Jerusalem will be rebuilt now because of the decree that is going out to, for the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. But some 69 sevens later, the city of Jerusalem would again be destroyed, and the temple would be destroyed again as well. And we know that you know, that happened in AD 70 when the Roman emperor and his uh, folks were really upset with the Jewish people for their rebellion against the Roman Empire and kind of destroyed the city and all of that. And then he goes on to say, Daniel, the end will come like a flood. Now, I'm of the opinion that he is pushing things towards the end times, the 70, uh, 70th week. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. In other words, till the end of times, there will be war, and there will be desolations, and all of that. Since we have the benefit of looking at these things from hindsight, we know that the 69 weeks are over, because the Messiah has come, and he was crucified, he was killed, but not for himself, and so on. What about the seventh week? What about the 70th week is a question that we may have. Look at what is written there. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Who will confirm a covenant with whom? Now, I'm going to speak now from a dispensational premillennialist view, point. All right? We discuss these different groups of people with their different you know, viewpoints and all of that. This particular thing is coming from this perspective, a dispensational premillennial view. According to them, this he is referring to the Antichrist, and many, actually the Hebrew there is the many, referring to the Jews, and therefore the Antichrist will confirm a covenant with the Jews for one seven. And it is from this context, this one seven, meaning seven years, that the dispensational premillennialists argue that the tribulation is going to last seven years. All right, that's the, this is the place from where they get that number, seven years. And the Antichrist, uh, no matter, uh, I, I mean, he would make a peace treaty with the Israelites and probably bring about peace in the Middle East situation. Maybe he has helped in the building of the temple there so that the Dome on the Rock and the temple are both existing side by side. These are just assumptions that I'm throwing out there. All right, and 
But the end, in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. Who would do that? The Antichrist would do that according to the dispensationalists. And the temple, he will set, and at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. In other words, by the time three and a half years have passed by, he will change, he will begin to show his true color and he will probably place an idol in the temple. And this is the reason why many interpreters of prophecy say that there is a temple that has to come up in Jerusalem for the people of God, the Jewish people, because this prophecy would not be fulfilled without that temple there. And therefore, he would set up an abomination that would cause desolation in the temple, but he would be brought to an end, and the end that is decreed for him would come upon him. And that is the 70th year, which according to these interpreters is still into the future and is pointing to a time that is yet to come. And when the 77s are over, we would, we would see the transgression being finished. And this is happening with the second coming of Jesus, the 70th end of the second, 70th week, transgression being finished sin being ended, wickedness being atoned for, everlasting righteousness being ushered in, vision and prophecy being sealed forever, and the most holy one being atoned. I have one or two charts that I wanted to bring to our attention explaining these 70 weeks. You see the starting point, and by the way, there are differences of opinion on these things as well, but I'm trying to just bring to us one perspective, which I think is probably valid. All right, 445 BC is the time when Artaxerxes, one of the emperors of the Persian Empire, gave a decree to Nehemiah and the other people for the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. And so seven weeks and the uh, 62 weeks, totally 69 weeks, some people calculate these in terms of lunar months, and therefore lunar years, one year having 360 days, so 483 years being 483 multiplied by 360 equal to 173,880 days. Now, with all their calculations, they have found out that from 444 BC, they know the exact month and the exact day when this decree was issued, if you count 173,880 days, you come to the Palm Sunday. That's the exact day to which the 483 years are over. All right? And the Palm Sunday is the week in which Jesus is betrayed, he is caught, and he is crucified. And so after the 69 weeks, you find the Messiah being cut off. And you also find Jerusalem and the temple being destroyed. And there happens to be a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. And that gap is not clear to Daniel, but from hindsight, we may assume that this mystery was not revealed to Daniel, the mystery of the church age. And that's what has come in in between. And the 70th week is yet to be, and that begins with Antichrist's covenant with Israel. He, in the middle of it, breaking his covenant and demanding worship and Messiah's return in power and all of that. And I recognize that there are multiple interpretations about this particular event, but I have the time only to present one view to all of us, and therefore, uh, that's, this is the one that I chose to bring to our attention. So Dan, somebody asked me the other day, is it easier to interpret the book of Daniel or is it easier to interpret the book of Revelation? My personal response to that is probably the book of Daniel. Because most of the things that Daniel has said, maybe 90% of the things that Daniel has said, has already been fulfilled. And it's history. And therefore we can be sure of what he said. As compared to the book of Revelation, which seems to be still into the future and therefore complicated and very difficult to interpret. I had another map that I wanted to bring to our attention, but I will just close. Some takeaways from our discussions about the end times. Guys, I have two minutes, let me close. <laughs> Number one, fulfilled prophecies point us to an all-knowing, all-powerful, and great God. We have better clarity about the kind of God that we serve and the kind of word that he has given to us. And that's one of the goals of me trying to explain all these things that we might have a better understanding of God and his word.
Number two, fulfilled prophecies give us confidence regarding prophecies concerning the future. Right? When we see all these prophecies being accurately fulfilled, and then you see these bunch of prophecies that are still into the future, you look at them and you say, if these have been fulfilled, these will be fulfilled too. Now, number three, the series like the end of the age is so that we may be helped to prepare for the coming of our master, our Lord, our king, our judge, and our bridegroom. All right. And finally, may our study of the end times help us be better evangelists and witnesses to the unbelieving. Look at how God is witnessing to the most powerful people in society. I was thinking to myself how he witnessed to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, plague after plague. You know, he had proof after proof that God is God and nobody else. To King Nebuchadnezzar, through Jeremiah and through Daniel and others, he had his personal encounters with God. God is revealing himself to these pagan kings. To King Cyrus, God is witnessing himself and he's trying to draw the attention of people towards himself. But they did not repent and come to the Lord. Well, the ball was in their court. God did all that he could, but the decision is for them to make. Despite all the proofs that they had, they decided not to follow the Lord. We might be discouraged when we share our faith with people and we see people disinterested or not wanting to believe what the word of God says. But God himself has been testifying to people about himself and not everybody has been listening to him. But I believe this study of the end times should make us better evangelists and better witnesses of the God of the Bible, the God of prophecy. And some of these things we may want to share with our friends in our workplace as well, so that that might probably be a starting point for them to enter into Scripture. So may God enable us to be better prepared for the coming of Christ and also be better witnesses of the gospel. Shall we close and look to the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for your word, Lord, and we thank you for the power and clarity with which it comes to us. Lord, you are amazing in the way that you provided panoramic views of future history to Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar and others in the book of Daniel, O Lord. We thank you for the plans that you have for us as individuals the plans that you have for nations, the plans that you have for humanity as a whole. And we pray, Lord, that you would make us better disciples of you. You would draw us closer towards you. And Lord, you would help us be better witnesses and evangelists of the gospel. We submit ourselves into your hands, Lord, as we continue now to spend time in your presence in worship and prayer and intercession. May your presence be real among us and may your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray.